Hello and welcome to Shoreline Music Monthly. Uh, my name is Mark Koshwitz and uh, I'm freshly refreshed from our July hiatus and uh, I think we've got a pretty good show to come back to you on. I hope, uh, I hope you folks have all been out there enjoying the music on the Connecticut shoreline because this, this is the time of year when it really shines. And if, um, if you're on Facebook and haven't liked our page yet, please do uh, because we try to share a little uh, information on events that are going on, especially if they uh, include alumni from this very show. So uh, find us, like us, and uh, I hope your summer's going well. Uh, tonight on the Cabinet of Curiosities, we're going to be looking at an instrument that is over a thousand years old, yet uh, strangely was named about 60 years ago, uh, the kalimba. And, uh, that will be, uh, I had fun with that. And in the, uh, in the studio with me tonight, we're gonna be stepping outside of what has been, I guess, the, uh, our normal genre, the rootsy flavored kind of stuff. Have a gentleman in the studio today who uh, plays a bit of classical guitar and uh, not only performs other people's pieces, but actually uh, composes himself. So I would like to uh, welcome Eric Simon Vorite a Vorite Vorite a there thank yeah, you perfect thank you I apologize <laughs> that's all right I, uh, I I did my best no that's fine <laughs> that's fine well, well welcome to the show thank you um, it's great to have you on <laughs> and um, so how, uh, classical guitar very mm -hmm. cool I play a little guitar myself but I've been playing for for many years and, I, and I'm really quite bad at it okay um, so we won't get into that, but um, how, how long have you um, been playing? I've been playing about 13 years, I would say. I started when I was five. Wow, <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah, thanks. Um, now we, we focus a lot on songwriting mm -hmm. um, on this particular show, and I guess, I mean, I understand a lot of the, the folks, you know, the music that we have on a lot with, uh, you know, whether it's rock and roll or blues or, or folk, um, you know, a lot of what people write are, are to get out, you know, particular ideas. Um, from a writing standpoint, where, where does the, I mean, where does the idea, I guess, germinate, you know, being instrumental music? Um, how does that work? I guess it just all has to do with inspiration. Like, I'll listen to a different, a lot of different kind of genres and a lot of different artists and just by all of those artists I can kind of find my own style and what I really enjoy playing myself. So I don't necessarily need vocals on it and I can just really make it my own through the music. Very nice. Thanks. Very nice. Um, so how long have you been writing? Um, well I've always just made up little things for fun like little riffs or whatever just since I started playing and I've never been too serious about writing and now I'm just starting to make a few of my own songs just for fun. So it all starts with ideas and now it's just starting to branch out. Oh, very nice. I, I look forward to hearing some of them tonight. Thanks. Five years old, um, mm -hmm. was, was it your idea? It really wasn't. I didn't really know what I wanted to do or if I wanted to play guitar so my mom just signed me up with the neighborhood music school in New Haven and oh, then I just kept nice. on doing it since. Excellent. Yeah, that's a that's a I mean, that's a wonderful thing, especially with uh, it seems that music's getting removed from schools right. more and more. And, and uh, I like mom, mom proactively yes. uh, <laughs> signing that up. Very cool. Yeah. So uh, apparently you must have taken to it uh, quite well. Right. Definitely. I know a lot of other students I would I was with, they would start with classical guitar and then eventually they would just break off into like electric guitar or just playing guitar for fun but I always really enjoyed it and I found out that when you stick with it it really sounds good so then you can continue and it's just progressed ever since. Very cool. Yeah. Well I'm certainly looking forward to hearing you play. Thank you. <laughs>
Right, I am back with Eric, and um, we're going to try again um, the From the Hip segment where I'm just going to ask a handful of random questions that uh, don't need elaborate answers, I guess, and um, let's see where we end up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eric, um, how many different states have you lived in? Lived in? I've basically been in Connecticut my whole life, but I was adopted from St. Petersburg, Russia. So that's really? not exactly a state. No, <laughs> no, but it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it counts. So, um, okay, so, but you've been here your whole life in Connecticut. Right. See, I find out this darndest stuff. Yeah, <laughs> the questions work. You're, um, how about your favorite guitar player that you don't know personally? Okay. Um, I would have to say um, some of the old blues guitarists like B.B. King. I've never met or anything, but it's just they're really inspirational, I think, and I've never met them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excellent. I'm a big, huge blues fan Great. myself, so I'm right there with you. Um, kind of a recurring question. Cannolis, yes or no? Absolutely. Of course. I am over. <laughs> uh, but you're in the majority, apparently. Okay, so good. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. Um, any other instruments that you play? Yes, actually, I collect musical instruments as a oh, hobby, you are the and man. then I learn how to play them. So I mostly focus on strings. I also have a banjo, ukulele, mandolin. But also in school, I played the saxophone and the trumpet, and I taught myself the piano. I just like instruments. I probably should have asked, are there any other instruments you don't play? I don't play the trombone. Oh, I have one. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. We're going to have to have you back then. I'll have okay. to bring some other stuff. Great. I'd love to. Um, <laughs> your favorite breakfast cereal? I would have to say Honey Nut Cheerios. Okay. Solid choice. Thanks. Um, and, <laughs> and as it's summer, um, your favorite summertime Connecticut shoreline destination? Ooh, on the Connecticut shoreline, I would have to say anywhere outside the beach, just Connecticut, we're really lucky to have the Long Island Sound. Absolutely. Yeah, it's always great to go down there. All right, so you're an outdoors guy then. Yeah, absolutely. Can we take the guitar out and play on the beach? I could. I would want to use a little bit less good guitar, probably, <laughs> so it doesn't get damaged. You yeah. bring your banger. <laughs> right, exactly. All right, well, thank you for uh, yeah. sitting through this, Eric, <laughs> and uh, we'll get back to the music. Okay, sounds great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks.
Welcome to Cabinet of Curiosities. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be talking about the kalimba, uh, also sometimes known as the thumb piano, for reasons that will become evident shortly. Uh, it's an instrument that was uh, invented in Africa, most likely between 1300 and 3000 years ago. Yet, strangely, uh, the, t the term kalimba was coined quite possibly by an Englishman in the 1950s. So it turns out that this instrument actually, in fact, has many different names. And as it spread across the continent of Africa, each of the different cultures um, coined their own term for it. Uh, it's known as uh, Sansa, Sansa, uh, Mimbura, um, which may be the, the oldest and uh, most often used outside of the United States. But overall, the group of instruments that would contain the mimbura, kalimba, etc., are lamellophones uh, from lamella, which is Latin for plate, and phone, which is um, from the Greek for sound. So let's, um, why don't we take a, actually a closer look at actually what it is. It's typically a board that is uh, attached to some sort of resonator, in this case, it's a, a wood box with, um, with a hole in it. Um, think uh, the body of an acoustic guitar, perhaps, um, to give the uh, resonance for the notes. But sometimes they are built onto or actually placed inside of a hollowed out uh, gourd to uh, provide the same effect. Uh, the notes are produced by plucking the attached metal or wooden tines uh, with the thumb. which is why they're sometimes called a thumb piano, as you probably now see why. But it's the, um, it's the layout of the notes that I find fascinating. Um, think of most, most musical instruments, um, piano for instance, uh, the lowest notes are all to the left and they slowly rise in pitch as you move across the keyboard to the right. Or a stringed instrument perhaps, like a guitar, where your lowest notes are down by the headstock and they rise in pitch as you move up the neck of the guitar. In the mimbura, has the lowest notes in the middle and each side goes up in pitch as you move away from center. And they are arranged in a kind of interlocking pattern where the notes bounce back and forth on either side of the middle. If I were to just play the notes from center going up in one direction, or the other. They're, they're laid out in an interlocking pattern. If you go back and forth, you get the scale. And this allows the player to have access to higher and lower notes um, with each of the thumbs, as opposed to having to have both of them on one side, perhaps. So changing the tunings on one of these is, is pretty easy as the uh, longer tines produce the lower tones where the, the shorter they get, the higher the pitch. So you think of this as like the nut on a guitar um, that the string would run over by just shortening the tine, sliding it one way or the other to make it longer or shorter, you, you adjust the pitch. So this. Uh, makes tuning them and changing the note layouts very easy, which has given rise to um, most uh, of the different cultures in Africa have their own tunings. Uh, many individual players themselves have actually come up with unique tunings that they use in their work. There are literally dozens, maybe hundreds, of, of different uh, Mimbura tunings. The most common is the Naya Maropa so let's get back to um, the actual term kalimba and where it came from. In the 1920s, uh, an English ethnomusicologist uh, named Hugh Tracy traveled to Africa and spent years researching and recording um, the music that he found there. Uh, he encountered an instrument known as the mimbura, and he fell in love with it and spent decades um, documenting the different tones uh, the different note layouts, uh, 
that were used in all the different cultures. In the mid-50s, he started his own company making what he termed at that point kalimbas, um, which is actually a Bantu word meaning little music. So I think it's kind of a pretty cool name for this little guy. So I'll give him that and began importing them into America and Europe. They had quite possibly never been seen outside of Africa in the thousands of years they existed before the mid-50s due to a one man, Hugh Tracy. So I'm going to be um, straight up with you folks. I mess around with just about all the gizmos that, uh, that I own because I pretty much love every musical instrument that I have found so far. But I have also come to the realization that I'm a fairly pathetic kalimba player. And recalling the Hawaiian Tremoloa debacle of 2014, I've enlisted some help um, to demonstrate this. So uh, I contacted a gentleman named Kevin Spears, who's a very accomplished kalimba player, and he has allowed me to use some of his videos to demonstrate uh, what they actually uh, sound like in the hands of someone who might know what they're doing. So I give you now Kevin Spears. Mr. Spear is quite talented young man. Um, I'm actually going to go out on another one of his pieces because I really enjoy when people take uh, instruments and, and maybe push the boundaries of what they're capable of. And this piece that we're going to go out on is um, incorporates a looper and some various effects on it, and he slowly builds a nice textured piece, um, which I really love. So I'm going to go out on that, but as always, um, this is we're just scratching the surface on these things. If any of this intrigues you, Look it up, go find one yourself, and uh, if you can make a sound on something, you could probably play it. All right, once again, um, we'll see you next month, and once again, Kevin Spears. <laughs> Well, thanks once again for watching Shoreline Music Monthly. It's summertime on the Connecticut shoreline, so get out there and enjoy it. There's music all around. Remember, you folks are the local in the local music, so get out and see a show. We'll see you next month.